God do with it what he's going to do. So praise the Lord. Do you have your Bibles? Let's open them up to Acts chapter 14. As we look today at enduring as a good soldier of Christ, let's pray and ask for God to bless our time together. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for this morning. I thank you, God, for showing us how to be a good soldier and God giving us examples, not just seeing you, but Lord, seeing men like us, women like us from the scripture that lived it out as they followed you. And Lord, obviously today we are looking at Paul and Barnabas. And to see the soldiers that they were, God, the fact that they went out into the battlefield and headed straight on into the battle, Lord, and were used in great ways, we want to be used that way as well. And so, Lord, we want to see what they did, how they did it, and we want to learn how to be good soldiers for you. So I pray, Lord, as we get into your word this morning, that you would open up your word to us, that you would be our teacher, and we look forward to what you have for us this morning in your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it's interesting when you think about being a good soldier. I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but if you know Jesus Christ, you are a soldier right now. You may not know you're a soldier. You've probably heard that. Uh, Maybe you sang the song in Sunday school when you were a kid or whatever, but you're really a soldier for the Lord. And the bottom line is, is there's two kinds of soldiers. There's those that sit there and get shot at, and there's those that get up and take the battle to the enemy. And if you're not putting on the armor every day, getting in the word of God, getting in prayer, moving forward in battle, you're getting shot at. You say, well, I'm not getting shot at because I'm not really out in the battle. You're getting shot at whether you go to the battle or not. Because trust me, if you've given your life to the Lord, the battle's coming to you. And the battle will come in your home. It'll come to your, uh, your wife, your husband, your kids, uh, your workplace. You're in the battle. And you're either a dodging Christian Or you're a Christian that says, okay, look, I'm getting shot at. I might as well put on some armor. I might as well pick up my weapon, and I might as well go into battle. And so that is what I want to encourage you to do today. God has called you to be a soldier that's heading into battle. Now, there is a preparation time. Even as we have the earthly, uh, you know, uh, armies or whatever, you have the boot camp time where there's training. And then God sends you into the main battle that he's called you to do. And that boot camp can, can vary from, from, you know, time to time, depending on what God has called you to do. But we look at a great model of that with the children of Israel when God was bringing them out of Egypt. It's interesting, when God brought them out of Egypt, God said, this is my army, Now think about that. Would you want this to be your army? Again, they had been slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years. All they knew how to do was work in the mud and make mud bricks and do all this. There was no training with military, no weapons training, no this kind of thing. But God said, you are my army, and he brought them out. And that's how we are when we first give our life to the Lord. God brings us out of Egypt, and he says, there you are. You're my warrior. You're my army. We're thinking, you've got the wrong guy. I'm not really a warrior, and uh, your army's pretty awesome, but I can't certainly be a part of it. No, he says, you are. I just have to train you. And so then the training began with the children of Israel. Did you realize that if you came straight out of Egypt and went up the coast, it's an 11-day journey to Israel? They spent 40 years in the wilderness. Why? Because God said they weren't ready for battle. Now, they didn't spend 40 years because they weren't ready for battle. They were only supposed to spend two years. God brought them into the wilderness, and that was their boot camp. He took them to Mount Sinai, and during that time, every day they were in the Word, and they were in prayer, and God was speaking to them. And that's exactly what happens to us. We give our life to the Lord, and God wants us in the Word. He wants us in prayer. He wants us learning and growing and getting prepared for the battle. Now, that doesn't mean they weren't serving right away. They no doubt were helping to clean up the stalls and move the animals and move things around. Again, that service to the Lord can begin day one when you give your life to the Lord. And for those who do it, I think it should. For those who do it, there's going to be a reward. You're going to grow that much faster. But the actual call into the ministry that God has called you into oftentimes is delayed until you get the proper training. Once they had two years worth of training, they were ready to go into the promised land. And God said to them, now go in and take the land. And what did they say? They had gone to see the land and they said, no, there's giants. It's too hard. It's too hard. This this thing you've called us to do, God, is beyond us. We can't do it. And God said, because you said that, you're going to now live in the wilderness rather than walk in the promised land and free in the spirit that I planned for your life. Guys, there is a scary application here for us. So don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that if you've missed your opportunity to go into the land that you can't repent and go into the land today. But what God is saying is, if you're the Christian that says, this is too hard, I can't turn from that sin, I don't have the power to stop doing that, I can't deal with that situation, what you're saying is to God is, the giants are too big. It's too hard for me to take the land. I know you've called me to do it. I know you told me you'd give me the power to do it, but I can't do it. He says, then you're gonna live in the wilderness. 
And some of you this morning are living in a spiritual wilderness because you will not believe the word of God, the power of God. Get up, put on your armor, and move forward in battle and trust the Lord. And what God is saying to you this morning is, get up, put on your army, and move into the promised land. You don't have to live in a wilderness any longer. Now, is there God-ordained wilderness? Absolutely. Remember, God sent them there for a couple of years. I spoke to a brother in the Lord that's in one right now. I spoke to him last night. He's going through a struggle of, of dryness. He's like, I don't understand this. I'm walking with God. I'm in the Word every day. I'm in prayer, and everything is so dry. I said, you know what? God is working in your life. You let him work. God is refining you. God is molding you. God is shaping you. God is saying to you, okay, I know you love me when it feels good. What about when you don't feel anything? Do you still love me? Is this for better or for worse? Is this for richer or for poorer? Or is this just when it's exciting and I'm seeing miracles and I feel God's spirit and I've got tinglies and the teaching was good? When is your walk committed to God? Is it committed to God when things are bad, when things are hard? Guys, this is where the rubber hits the road. And so God is gonna allow every believer, he's allowed me to go through it. It may happen again, I don't know. He's gonna allow, allow you to go through dry times, through hard times. Some of you in this room, you're in it right now. You're saying, yeah, he's allowed it, I'm in it right now. It is God ordained and God is working. Trust him. Stay as a faithful soldier. Continue to soldier on. Don't lose heart. God will give you what you need to continue on in the journey. You know, it's like those guys that are running and the person's there with the cup and they hand them the cup, you know, and they take a drink or whatever. That drink is enough to make them go another few miles or whatever to the next guy with the next cup. God will give you a drink this morning if you'll open up your heart and receive it. It may not be the gulp that you want, but God will give you a drink and he'll give you what you need to survive. Don't die in the wilderness like the children of Israel. The giants are not too big. Our God is bigger than any giant. Trust him, believe his word, and move forward. Listen, but I'm afraid, so am I. We're all afraid. Now, a few guys will admit that, right? Girls might admit it more than a guy would. We can't say we're afraid. Everybody has fear, especially when you go into battle. Anybody that's going into battle, they're gonna have fear. Now, once the adrenaline kicks in, the fear oftentimes disappears. But the reality is, there's going to be that fear. Don't be afraid. Trust the Lord. And for some of you, God is calling you saying, look, it's time for you to step up and be a soldier. Don't just get shot at. Get into the battle. Get into the warfare. Because serving the Lord is not always easy. And when we step out in the name of the Lord, we are reminded quickly that indeed the battle is real. And the battles that Paul and Barnabas went through, when I look at the battles they went through, guys, they're nothing compared to us today. If we look at this in contrast, now, we all have battles and we may have greater battles in the last days as we move forward like they did in the early church. But right now, we don't have the kind of battles they had. They had threats of violence. They, had, they were run out of town. They were stranded at sea. They were beaten multiple times with stripes, thrown in jail, as we're, we're going to see today. It would appear that Paul was even killed and resurrected. Now, we don't know. Paul himself is going to say, I don't know whether I was dead or not. But the reality is, how many of us have been killed and gotten back up and said, all right, well, where's the next ministry opportunity, Right. I say that tongue in cheek because that's probably not going to happen to too many people. But the reality is we're, we're so quick to give up. We're so quick to throw in the towel and say it's too hard. Look, there is a reward waiting for you. And if you get into the battle, God will give you the strength you need for the battle. And then you have the reward of heaven waiting on you. Has anybody noticed this life goes by really fast? Man, it goes by quick. I seem to talk about it more the older I get. It's like I remember being 18. And all of a sudden one day it's like, Whoa! Here I am standing here like I'm 60 years old. What happened? You look in the mirror, you know, you're not, no, you don't look like you did when you were 18, you know, and it wasn't that great at 18, so it's really bad now, right? <laughs> so the reality is, is that, you know, guys, it happens fast. We've only got a little bit of time left. Grab onto it. You're gonna regret it in heaven if you don't. Listen, you're gonna get in the kingdom if you know the Lord. You're gonna have a great reward. We're all gonna be sitting at the wedding supper laughing and rejoicing. That's gonna be a great time. But how much better to get there and say, you know what, I chose to get up and fight, I chose to go into the battle and not just sit back. Yep, I've got a few scars, but it was worth it. By the way, those of you that have scars, which I know really is everybody in here, you've all got scars. Everybody's heart, unless you're super, super young, and you've got scars on your heart. Those scars are used in tremendous ways for the kingdom of God. Every time that lash goes upon your heart, God is preparing you to be a greater soldier for the Lord. And you know what happens? When you endure those scars and you go through that pain and you go through that hurt and you learn to forgive and you learn to move on, then when that person stands in front of you and they've got that same scar that just happened, you remember exactly what you felt like when you were in that place and you look at them with compassion and you say, you know what? Let's pray. And you pray from your heart. 
and you pray for their heart and you watch God strengthen. Some of you may be getting scars on your heart right now for the person that's gonna come to you next year that needs your help. Recognize that God is working. Recognize that God is doing a work. There's a purpose. God doesn't waste a drop, guys. Remember when they fed the 5,000 and fed the, uh, you know, the, the, when God fed the multitudes, he told me, he said, gather everything up. Get all the fragments. Why? The whole principle was that God doesn't waste anything. Every suffering moment you go through, every painful moment you go through, every whatever it is, God is using it if you'll let him for his glory and for your growth to be more like him. And so allow God to do that. I know it's not fun, and if you're in that place of dryness, it will pass. If you're in that place of wilderness, then again, uh, if it's a boot camp time and God's training, then praise the Lord. If it's because you believe the giants are too big and you refuse to go in the land, then take action today. And Paul and Barnabas were those types that said, you know what, we're gonna do this. We're gonna move forward. Now again, I know that it comes at different stages. Paul and Barnabas were pretty far down the road at this point. And so we grow and we mature when we step out and do things like this missionary journey that was quite literally about a year long. That's quite the missionary trip. Can you imagine going on a missionary journey for a year? And why was that? Because everywhere they traveled, it was by foot. And it was miles and miles and miles. And we read about them going up to Iconium. That was almost 100 miles. And then they go down to Lister and Derby. That's another 40 or 50 miles. And they're going back and forth walking these long distances. You talk about soldiers who made their mind up, I'm going to follow the Lord and I'm going for it. These guys went for it. And so I don't say that to put us to shame. I say that to wake us up and help us to realize if we're truly going to serve the Lord, it's going to, there's going to be a cost that comes with it. And it's going to be difficult sometimes. I mean, everywhere Paul went, pretty much there was a riot or ended up in jail. And so we have to be mentally prepared for this. We have to understand this. You know, if you ever watch any of these documentaries on battles or wars or whatever, I don't know if any of you ladies are into that, but there's something that God puts into a man sometimes. You know, you want to see about the battles and the wars or whatever. Man, they were miserable. Look, I didn't grow up in a military family. I didn't have military around me, so I never was, really never had a desire for military, although I think it's awesome. And those of you that did it, praise the Lord for that because that's a call of God. And God puts you in that place, and we appreciate that. But when you go back and look at these battles that these people went through and these, these, these men or whatever, I mean, they had times where it was like raining for a month straight in the middle of a jungle, right? And you, have, and you think about it, if you've ever gone camping, you know, and, and had the rainstorm come, some of your campers, and, or, or any kind of situation where you're out in the outdoors and it becomes miserable, like in 30 minutes seems like five hours, right? And it lasts forever. We just try to make it through the night to get to the next day and get out of there. These guys lived in that. And they were, their, their shoes were always wet. Their jackets were always soaked. They were always miserable. All their meals were inundated with water. They would jump up in the middle of the night and have to start fighting with weapons and warfare. You know what I mean? I mean, this kind of stuff is going on all the time. So that's what real battle is. And then when we do the spiritual battle, it's not typically gonna be that type of thing for us in that scenario. But there may be stretches of warfare that wear us down. God's gonna be faithful to give you what you need to do it. But you've got to learn to be a good soldier. Um, and it's interesting. I think part of being a good soldier, soldier is realizing there's no turning back at this point. Okay, we've made the commitment. We're not turning back. And know this, we are going to get the victory. We serve from a position of victory. Yes, we get hurt. Yes, we take shrapnel. Yes, we get shot at and sometimes hit. But God has already said, you will live forever in the kingdom of God and you're gonna have reward. Don't turn back. Be faithful. Don't, once you put your hand to the plow, don't look back. And realize, I will give you the victory. Once you step in, God will give it. Just trust him. You know, when Julius Caesar, according to history, it says when he landed on the shores of Britain, he was a great leader and, and a great, uh, had great victories for the Roman uh, armies and government. Uh, he was there with his Roman legions there on the shores of Britain. And it says he took a very bold and decisive step to ensure the success of his military venture. Ordering his men to march to the edge of the cliffs of Dover, um, he told them to look down at the water below. Unbeknown to them and to their amazement, or unbeknown to them and to their amazement, they saw every ship in which they had just crossed the channel engulfed in flames. They had no way of escape and no way of retreat. Caesar had deliberately set the boats on fire and cut off any possibility of retreat so that the soldiers knew they were unable to return, they were unable to retreat, and there was nothing left for them to do but advance forward and conquer. And that's exactly what they did. They advanced forward and had a great victory there in that region. That is what God wants for us as believers. He wants us to realize there's no turning back. The world has nothing for you. 
There's nothing left in the alcohol. There's nothing left in the drugs. There's nothing left in the sexual activity. There's nothing left, you name it. Whatever the list is of your vice, whatever you came out of, if you did, there's nothing left in that for you. I had someone say to me recently, you know, it seems harder now sometimes being a Christian than it was in the world. I said, yeah, but if you ever go back to the world, you'll find out how empty it is. And the things that used to satisfy you, they don't satisfy you, they make you miserable. Because you're no longer that person. You're a new person now in Christ. And by the way, when you do give your life to the Lord, yes, sometimes the battle does get more intense. I found that after coming to the Lord, there were some things in life that became more difficult than before I knew the Lord. But you need to know that as a believer, not to think that you give your life to the Lord and now it's easy peasy and there's nothing to worry about. No, we are in that battle. But I'm telling you, the reward is worth it. God always is faithful to fill us and refresh us and use us. And when you see the victory, it is so wonderful to see the victory. It's such a joy. And so God wants us fully committed in the battle, no retreat, no turning back. And this is exactly where we see Paul and Barnabas as good soldiers of the Lord as we take up here in chapter 14 uh, as they carry on in this first missionary journey that they've got out on. Now, we ended last week, if you remember, them fleeing Iconium, again, about 90 to 100 miles away or so for Lystra and Derby as their lives were being threatened. And now we take up in Lystra where we're going to see an amazing miracle that God does through Paul and, uh, and also an attempted assassination of Paul, which, again, he may have actually been killed. We don't know. Uh, it is interesting. I want to point this out. You wonder, why doesn't God do the same miracles? You notice it says that God did witness, God bore miracles through them to bear witness uh, as they were traveling. And God does miracles today. Don't get me wrong. But why did God do so many then? And I think in different times of seasons of world history, he's done that, even in church history. The reason being is, is to bear witness. It's to show that God is moving, that God's really involved. And especially when you think about Paul and Barnabas going out with no Bibles yet. People didn't have Bibles. They couldn't go home to look and see what it said in this, in this book or that book or whatever. It was being written by Paul while he was journeying. So they simply had to believe what they were saying. Well, what would verify what they were saying? The miracles. And so the miracles were used to bear witness. We're going to see one right here that's going to be used to bear witness today. And notice he says in Lystra, verse 8, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. Now, again, the Holy Spirit sets the stage here right off the bat to make it clear that this was a supernatural miracle, okay? This was not just whatever. This man had never walked. Everyone knew that he couldn't walk. No sleight of hand here. He has no strength in his feet. He's crippled from birth. He's never walked. He's completely helpless. But the cool thing about this is even when we are completely helpless, God is not and power is there to transform this man's life. You may be feeling helpless this morning like that cripple in whatever condition. Maybe you're not crippled, but maybe you feel helpless in some other way. God is here in power to minister to that if you let him. And God will do that. And so notice what happens here. It says in verse nine, this man heard Paul speaking and Paul observing him intently, seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet and he leaped and walked. Now this is amazing here for a number of reasons. First of all, notice it says that Paul could see that this man had faith to be healed. I wonder what that looked like. Now, I think you could also see in the spirit, but no doubt this man's eyes were locked on Paul, and he's believing this. Now, this is, it would appear to be street witnessing. Uh, we're going to see there's a lot of pagan worshipers out there, so this wasn't in a synagogue. And so they're out street witnessing, no doubt. Paul's giving this message out there in the streets. He sees this guy, they lock eyes, and this guy's got this, look, I believe this. And this, there's, there must be some intensity to his face, recognizing that he, he was hearing the word of God and believing it. But I believe there's something else going on here. And that is, I believe God spoke to Paul and gave Paul a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is a gift where God speaks something to you that you could not have known if God hadn't supernaturally told you. It's only happened once or twice in my life. I think God uses the gifts when they're needed in our life in different ways. Some gifts operate more regularly. Some gifts don't as much. Um, but I know that there, I've seen this gift operate in my life before. And it's this thing where you know God said it. You know God just spoke to you. Somehow your spirit just knows it. And you know something about someone that you couldn't have known. This happened to Paul. And so Paul sees this guy. And again, he says, stand up on your feet. Now notice, Paul wasn't being presumptuous. And here's the thing I want you to get. Paul wasn't thinking that everyone that he said to stand up or that everyone that he prayed for or that everyone that he touched was going to be healed. And we don't see that in the scriptures. 
But when God tells Paul, I'm gonna do this, then Paul in boldness does it. And Paul here sees that he's gonna be saved or sees that he's gonna be healed, that God has put in his heart with the word of knowledge, I believe. He's told him about the Holy Spirit and he tells him to stand up. And, and again, we're gonna see if there's this great healing that takes place. Now, for just a moment here, a little bit about healing. Does God still heal today? Absolutely. But there needs to be an understanding about how God does healing. And there's a lot of teaching that is inaccurate in the church today I believe by well-meaning Christians, a lack of understanding of what was happening when Jesus walked on the earth and what's happening today, and that is that the Lord wants everybody healed. Now, let me say this. Ultimately, yes. Ultimately, God wants everyone healed. When Jesus comes back and rules in the millennial kingdom, all the blind will see, all the lame will walk, all the deaf will hear. He will heal everyone. And when Jesus walked on the earth, everyone around him that he touched was healed. And why? Because he was the millennial kingdom on the earth. He came down to earth. He was living the millennial kingdom. Jesus said when he was among the people, he said, the kingdom of God is among you. And so what he's saying is, I'm walking in that kingdom power. I'm walking in that messianic authority. I haven't taken the earth over yet, but I'm now walking in that power as long as I'm here, as long as the Son of Man is in the world, the light is in the world, is what he said. And that's why you see that everyone that he touched and healed or, or spoke to was healed, not just because he's God, but, but again, walking in that kingdom power, the position that God had put him at that time. Now, because of that, some falsely believe because Jesus healed everyone that we're supposed to pray and everyone's gonna be healed. And if you're not healed, you don't have enough faith. That just doesn't line up with scripture. Sometimes God heals, sometimes he doesn't. For example, I can give you one, uh, Paul himself cried out to the Lord multiple times, God heal me. And Paul had a gift of healing, right? He operated in that gift and the Lord didn't heal him. And the Lord said, you know what, Paul, not only am I not going to heal you, I gave you that. I, I gave you that thorn in the flesh. And the reason I gave you that thorn in the flesh, the scripture tells us, is to keep him humble. As we're going to see later, when Paul is apparently dead or else leaves his body or whatever the case is, he goes to where God is. He sees the third heaven. We'll get to that more in just a moment. And God wanted to keep Paul humble. Can you imagine seeing heaven? Can you suddenly imagine just being there and seeing the glory of God? It would be very easy to be a little bit puffed up. You would have information that nobody else has, and it would be quite the experience. And so, again, we'll get to that later, but God actually did that to Paul, and God ordained that Paul not be healed while here on earth. Now, let that sink in. That was God-ordained and designed by God. We also see that even Jesus didn't heal everybody. Now, he healed everybody that he touched. He healed everybody that he, tried, that he wanted to heal. But he didn't heal everybody he came in, uh, came in contact with or passed by. They had to cry out to him. I'll give you one example. Remember the man that was laid there at the gate beautiful for 38 years. And Peter and John came walking by up there that morning to go to the morning prayer. And they saw him and, and they said, you know, silver and gold we don't have. But in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And God gave a healing for that man. The Bible tells us that man had been placed there for 38 years or however long. Certainly he wasn't there as a baby, right? But however long he'd been placed there when he got old enough to be placed there. And, and was begging for money, if you will. That means the Lord walked by him for three and a half years every time he went in the temple, and the Lord didn't heal him. So Jesus didn't heal everybody, and everybody on earth wasn't healed while Jesus was here. But when Jesus did speak the word, they were healed because he walked in that kingdom of power. Now, I'm not trying to discourage you that the Lord's not gonna heal you this morning. He may. And, and our job is simply to ask. Anybody that asks for prayer or wants, we're going to pray for God to heal you, and we believe in God's power to heal you. But it's in God's hand, it's what he does. Paul wasn't presumptuous, you know, to take this upon himself. He said, stand up and walk because he realized, you know what? God has shown me that you are able to be healed. God has shown me through a word of knowledge, I believe, uh, and other ways that God is going to work in your life and heal you. So, so God touched him and God healed him. But again, his faith was ready to be acted on. And indeed, it was acted on. But there's something else I want you to grab here before we move on. What a miracle this was. Because when you read these miracles of these cripples walking, you thought, well, yeah, God just touched their muscles and their ligaments and they got up and walked. Guys, there's so much more involved in walking. How did you guys learn how to walk? You kind of wobbled, you know, fell into things or whatever the case might be. It, it's a learned skill. It's like riding a bicycle. You don't just stand up and walk if you've never walked. He would have had to go through physical therapy. He would have had to learn how to walk. Number two, uh, his muscles would have atrophied. Uh, the ligaments, everything would have been too weak to walk. It wasn't just that God said stand up and heal him. God had to rebuild those muscles, rebuild the ligaments. God had to teach him how to walk. There was an instantaneous rebuilding and miracle that took place. And so this guy begins to jump and leap and praise the Lord, which again, I'm sure I, we would all do if we had not been able to walk. And suddenly somebody said stand up and walk and we were able to. And look at verse 11. 
It says, and when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Laconian language, the gods have come down in the likeness of men. And remember, they worshiped all these false gods and all the Greek pantheon and all that went with that. And so they believed that these are gods. And notice this, Barnabas they called Zeus. He was the chief god of all of them. I don't know why they picked him. Maybe because Paul was talking the most, because Hermes was the talker. And Paul, Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. So again, they try to figure out which ones they are, and they're giving them this glory. Now, again, I can understand them responding to these guys this way because of their pagan beliefs, but you have to realize in this region, there would have been an extra sensitivity to any miracle that had been done by someone to believe that it was the gods coming among them. And why is that? Because according to the Laconian traditions, they believed that there was an ancient visit by Zeus and Hermes to their region, and everybody in the region rejected them. They wouldn't take them into their home. Uh, there was only one elderly couple called Bacchus and Philemon, according to their tradition, who graciously received them into their home, and because nobody else would receive them into their home, they destroyed the entire region, either by flood or earthquake. And so that was their tradition. So imagine when they hear this, they see this person rise up and walk. They're thinking, we're not going to blow it this time. You know, our ancestors were wiped out by these gods, which is not true, but was their tradition. So they're just looking at them like, you are the gods. You are Paul. I mean, you are uh, Zeus and you are Hermes and we're going to worship you now. So this sets up a very bad situation uh, to the point, notice this, then the priests of Zeus whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates intending to sacrifice to the multitudes. Now they're going to come and offer a sacrifice for Paul and Barnabas. Now I would say if you go to a town and you share the gospel and they bring out a sacrifice to you, something's going wrong. But again, remember, not that they'd done anything wrong. The point was, is that because of their tradition and because of their pagan beliefs, they were taking this wrong. They didn't see that it was the power of the God of Israel that they were presenting Jesus. They believed it was something else. So they're in full panic mode here. No, you can't be worshiping us. It's only God that's to be worshiped. That's why we've come all this long way is to get you away from this stuff. Notice verse 14. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out. Again, tearing your clothes, you remember, is a sign of great just tragedy. It's like, what are you doing? It's like, ah! You know, they're ripping their clothes. So they would have gotten the message. And they said, men, why are you doing these things? We also of men are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things, that is these false mythological gods, to the living God. Look, these are statues. You've got them up in front of your temples. Our God is alive. You're doing the wrong thing. Our God made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are in them who in bygone generations, bygone generations rather, allowed all nations to walk in their own way. So God allowed that for a while for you guys to have these pagan beliefs, in other words. Nevertheless, even though you were worshiping falsely, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good. And he gives us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness, and these sayings, they, with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Why? They believe that's what their gods gave them. The fruitful seasons, the rain, they had gods for everything. So what he's saying is, hey, God has given you all these things because he's good. What they're hearing is the gods have given us all these things because they're good, and we are two of those gods. So this is not going very good at this moment. Now, something happens between verse 18 and 19 where they were able to settle the issue. Because when we jump into verse, or rather, yeah, yes, when we jump into verse 19, we're going to see that the scene changes to where they're being chased by some people coming up to get after them from Iconium. But here's the bottom line. Somehow they calmed it down and ended up getting this thing to go the right direction. But again, look at these good soldiers. They're not only having to deal with the hardship of the mission field, but learning to adapt and follow the Spirit of God to deal with very sticky situations when you're out in the mission field. And again, when you're walking by the power of the Spirit and you go out in the name of the Lord, God will give you supernatural wisdom. I want you to know that. As you step out, God's gonna give you the weapons that you need. God's gonna give you the strength that you need. God will give you the direction to go. And if something weird happens, God will give you wisdom. I can't th tell you how many times going out, you know, whether it be on a mission trip or whether it, doing whatever, all of a sudden things do not go the way you planned and it's like God just gives supernatural wisdom. You know how to handle it. And so God gives them here supernatural wisdom and somehow it doesn't give the details of how they sorted this whole thing out, but obviously they did. And then look here at verse 19. 
It says, then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. Now, guys, for just a moment, remember how far that was. It's probably about 90 to 100 miles. Look, when, people, when you're doing the work of the Lord, there are those that are going to be so opposed to it, they won't stop until they stop you. These guys were literally traveling all that distance to come and chase them down from the ministry they were doing after they had left to try to attack them. And so don't be surprised as a soldier and a minister unto the Lord that people are going to come after you from time to time. And sometimes they'll come after you pretty hard. It might be through the internet. It might be through going to a boss. It might be through whatever the case. But don't be shocked by that. That's part of being a soldier for the Lord. It's a part of the spiritual battle. And I think, man, you know, somebody hates me enough to chase me on foot 80 miles or, you know, 90 miles, 100 miles, and they hate me pretty good. Uh, you know, typically it's just a few blocks with the lights flashing, but this is like a long way um, of those that are really mad at you. But notice this, and that's never happened to me. But anyway, I'm sure you have all had that experience. I haven't. <laughs> Again, <laughs> and it's usually my fault. And anyway, they came from Antioch. They came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. They hated him so much, and they hated the message of the gospel so much, they poisoned everyone's minds, like we talked about last week, to the point where they were ready to kill them. Now, again, here's a warning as a soldier of the Lord. There are going to be people that hate you for no reason. Truly, I, I, look, as I said jokingly, tongue-in-cheek, I've had people yell at me, and I deserved to be yelled at. But I've had situations that I knew were spiritual, where people that I don't even know, and nothing happened to them with a car or traffic or anything else, and they just yelled at me for no reason, didn't even know them. And I recognized, this is really weird. No, it wasn't just weird. It was demonic. And so the enemy can stir the people around you and move them in the way he wants to move them, and we need to be prepared for that and realize, hey, this is a spiritual battle. Why do we need to recognize it? Well, not just so we can dodge, you know, but we can pray. God, rebuke the enemy here. This is demonic. As you begin to pray and stand against it, then the battle takes place behind the scenes. This is simply demonic. As they're chasing them down, they literally drag them, you know, stone them to death and drag them out of the city. Now, typically, here's how uh, stoning to death took place. They would take you to a high place, throw you off so that you would be injured and couldn't run away. Then they would gather around you and throw stones at you until you died. Not a pleasant way to die. Now, it doesn't tell us if they threw Paul off of a high place or not. It doesn't tell us, you know, what the situation was, but they believed he was dead. And, you know, he was either totally unconscious in a deep state or he was dead because they drug him out of the city and they still believed he was dead. You know, again, so they drag him out of the city. They leave him there for dead. And so, again, they realize, again, this is where, again, that whole situation in the Bible where we hear what Paul says, look, I don't know whether I was in the body or out of the body, but I saw heaven. And this is where that episode happened. I want to read it to you. This is out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 and 4. And Paul writes this about this. Now, it's now 14 years after this event that we're reading this morning. But notice what Paul says. He's talking in third person about himself. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in body I do not know, or whether out of body I do not know, God knows. So he didn't even know whether he was dead or alive himself. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. And again, if you're like me, I know I've said it many times before, don't you wish he'd have still written them down? You know, what were the things you heard, Paul? Paul said, when I got there, it was so amazing. It was so otherworldly. It was so supernatural and wonderful. I can't even express it. There's no way to tell you what that was like. You're going to have to wait and see it for yourself. Again, that was Paul. Again, that's the vision God gave Paul. And that's why I believe Paul gave, uh, God gave Paul the thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. Because can you imagine, look, some of us handle importance more than others. And if thinking we're important gets in the way and pride comes in and suddenly we're unusable, then God can't use us. And God had big plans for Paul. He had to do something in his life. By the way, there may be some of you that are suffering with some ailment that God just won't heal and it's never gone away. And the reason God's doing that is because he wants to use you. And God knows that if he healed that, he couldn't use you to the extent that he wants to and is going to because again, it may be something that goes to your head. God knows us. He knows his kids. Look, look parents, you know what your kids are like. You know what your kids can handle, what they can do. You know everything about them. God knows everything about us. 
And so God only allows what he allows to protect us. And we have to trust him in that. And so God said, Paul, all right, I'm gonna kind of limit you in this. I mean, I'm gonna limit your healing here so that I can use you in the way that I wanna use you. And boy, did God use it. He wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Now, it's interesting here, before we move on, I wanna point out here, notice he went to the third heaven. This came up a couple of weeks ago, a week or two ago. Somebody said, how many heavens are there, right? And they, we hear about the, some false teaching of seven heavens and all these different things, whatever the case might be. The Bible teaches three heavens. That's all the Bible teaches. The first heaven is where the birds fly. It's called the heavens. It's the expanse above us, okay? The heavens are simply above us, the expanse. The second heaven is from the atmosphere where it ends and all of the universe out there in outer space. That's the second heaven. So mankind has been to the second heaven. But third, the third heaven, that's where God lives. That's God's abode. And so God's in the third heaven. That's when we get raptured, we will go to the third heaven. We will be with the Lord there having the wedding supper of the Lamb. Then we come back. Again, we've talked about that before. I look forward to that journey back through the universe. Uh, coming back down, I think it's gonna be awesome. Uh, seeing the universe from the back and working our way back to the earth and all this. But either way, we're gonna come back to the earth and we'll have again a thousand years. He'll rule and reign here on the earth as he brings, the, as we come with, uh, come with the Lord, 10,000s of his saints, if you will. Uh, when we return. So Paul says, you know, this is what happened with Paul when he, when this, this is the moment that that took place when they, they killed Paul, if you will. However, notice this, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And there's two things that are amazing. They gathered around him. Were they praying? They probably were. Either way, God resurrects Paul and, and, and he gets up. I know that if I got up after being, you know, uh, you know, put to death by the people in the city, I don't know that I'd be ready to run right back in. But a good soldier realizes that they've got to complete their duty. And that means, you know what? If, if, if they're going to take me out again, they take me out again. But we're not done here. I've got to go back. I've got to let all the believers know that God was faithful. They've got to see that God spared me. They've got to be encouraged and not be afraid. And there's probably numbers of reasons that Paul went back in. But can you imagine how encouraging it would have been to see Paul come back in there, again, probably looking like he just finished a prize fight, and saying, guys, it's going to be okay. You know, if somebody that's living a really cushy life, if they tell you that's gonna be okay, that's not real encouraging, is it? If their life is just, just wonderful, all their bills are paid, you know, beautiful home, beautiful car, beautiful family, everything's going great, and they say, hang in there, brother, it's gonna be okay, you know, whatever the case might be. I mean, I, that's appreciated, but it doesn't hold any real power, does it? But when somebody comes in looking like a Mike Tyson fight just finished and they were fighting Mike back when he was good, right? And they say, you know what? And they can barely talk and there's, you know, bruises everywhere. God is good and it's gonna be okay. That's encouraging. And some of you feel like you've been at the wrong end of a prize fight and you were the prize that got beaten up, but God has done something in your life that is precious and priceless. And you alone can minister to certain people that nobody else is gonna listen to. Look, you can minister to anybody and whatever they've been. Don't get me wrong, any background, you can minister to people. But when you've been through it and you can say, you know what, God was faithful, that has power because it gives them hope. Hey, if you made it, I can make it. So Paul goes back in and goes, guys, you can do this. You can do this. And notice the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. So they take out the next day. And notice verse 21, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Now, several things I want to note are, number one, they made many disciples. They didn't just go and preach the gospel. They led people to the Lord. Uh, not just leave, I'm, I'm sorry, they, they, they discipled them. And I want to say this, if you've not been discipled, that's why we have a discipleship ministry here. We have three levels of discipleship. And I want to encourage you, especially if you say, you know what, I feel like I'm in that desert. I've never gone through a proper biblical boot camp or whatever. I want to go and take the lamb, but I don't feel that I'm equipped. Get into discipleship. Go through discipleship. Let God pour into you. Let him grow you. Let him disciple you so you're ready for the battle. Well, Paul had this heart. He wanted them to be disciples, uh, discipled. So he made these disciples and they returned again. I love this because look at this. They could have just made a beeline back to Antioch. It would have been a lot quicker. But they went back to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. And we're going to see these other places. They stopped hundreds of miles. These guys are traveling to go back and minister to the saints. That shows you their heart and their commitment to be a soldier for Christ. It's like we're going to do this for the Lord. And notice they were strengthening the souls of the disciples exhorting them to continue in the faith. Now, that would have been an exhortation that would have had power. You know, yeah, they, man, they, they kicked, Paul, we think maybe he died. We're not sure. They did this. They kicked us out. They, they, he was stoned to death or whatever. This guy. And Paul's are saying, guys, you can do this. Come on, you can do it. If I did it, you can do it. That's encouraging. 
So they're, they're being strengthened because of the trials that Paul went through, even as we can strengthen others because of the trials that we've been through. And, and, and so he says, continue in the faith, saying this, and this would have had weight as well. We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. In other words, the Christian walk's not gonna be easy. Because life is hard. Has anybody noticed that? And the Christian life sometimes can be harder. Because you're taking arrows from the enemy. The world's not getting attacked by the enemy. He's already got them. There's no battle he needs to get them. They're just living in this crazy hard world because it's fallen. We have the crazy hard world that's fallen and the one that's attacking us. And so it's, it, this is something that as believers you have to realize through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. If we understand that mentally it makes it easier when the battle takes place. God never said it would be easy down here. He said he would give us the strength to do it and the power to be overcomers and then God would give us victory and eventually the kingdom with reward. And so Paul says, guys, hang in there. You're gonna make it. God's gonna be faithful. We have to go through many tribulations before we enter the kingdom of God. And when they appointed elders in every city and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And from there, they sailed to Antioch, now finally going back home, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work in which they had completed. So this year-long mission trip or whatever has now been completed. They go back. No doubt everyone there is very excited to hear what God did. They've been gone for a year. What did God do? And notice this, and when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Again, this continued work among the Gentiles, Paul's main call, if you will. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Guys, I wanna encourage you this morning. Be a good soldier for Christ. If you just sit there, you're gonna get shot at anyway. You might as well put on the armor. Get up every morning. Get in the word. Get in prayer. You say, well, I didn't have time this morning. I, look, we all have weird things that happen. But when you don't have time on those mornings, let me ask you a question. Is the enemy still gonna be shooting at you? I'm sorry, that's the reality. It's like, come on, it's like, can I get a break? I mean, we fought all night, you know, in the, in the jungles of whatever. Take it to a real battle. You know, the soldiers need some sleep. Can all you guys out there just give us a good night's sleep? Don't come in right now. It's raining, we're wet, we're exhausted, we fought all night. Hadn't even eaten yet. Give us a break, okay? We need whatever. No, they're coming in. And they're going, good. I'm glad you're weaker. I can take you out even all the more. Listen, when you get away from the word of God in prayer, that's when the enemy's gonna come in and attack because you're now weaker and he can take you all the more. Not legalism, not works. You don't have to do it to please God. The blood has pleased God. He's pleased by the blood. You're in heaven. You're accepted. You're the beloved. This has nothing to do with that. This is... The battle's coming to you, are you ready? So you need to put on the armor every day. You need to be in the word. You need to be in prayer. You need to be seeking God and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? I'm gonna get shot at anyway. I might as well get shot moving forward than just get shot sitting here. Let's go. And then let God lead you in where he's gonna lead you. For some of you, maybe you realize, you know what? Maybe I've been in the wilderness all these years. I don't see any real fruit in my life. Maybe God is saying, you know what? It's time to believe my word and get up and go into the promised land. Enter the battle. Trust that I'm gonna give you victory in all these areas. Wherever you are, we've covered all those today. Ask God to do that. He's here in power to do it right now. Open your heart and allow him to do it. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, for the work you've done this morning. And I thank you that you make us soldiers for Christ. Thank you, God. We're in the battle whether we like it or not. I mean, the war is coming to us. Help us to be ready. Help us to get up and be in the word, be in prayer. God, that is putting that armor on. That's what it is. And to go into the battle prepared for that, Lord. And, and Lord, we know the enemy's not going to let up. We can't let up either. And so encourage, Lord, your people uh, this morning to, to be faithful to do that, to become good soldiers. And if there's some that have been sitting on the sidelines and, and not really stepping into the battle, Lord, help them to get up and step into the battle. God, lead them into the direction that you want them to go. Help them, Lord, to walk into the promised land and to know that, yeah, there may be giants there, but our God is the greatest giant of the universe. Nobody can defeat our God. There is no greater giant than our God. And so, Father, pour out your spirit on your people. Thank you for the work of your ministry among your people. And we give you all the glory, Lord. Help us to be good soldiers, Lord, that we can stand before you one day and know that we gave you our all for our King. And, and, and Lord, we bless you and thank you for the work you've done this morning and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. If you need prayer, the pastors and